Can there be philosophy with no art? A philosophy is a love of wisdom, as Tricia mentioned before. Can we say that there is wisdom with no beauty? Are they two sides of the same coin? Can there be art without meaning, without search, after the beautiful, after the right, after the aesthetic and the harmony? Is there really a separation between art and philosophy? Between the search for beauty to the search for truth? It seems to me that they both philosophy and art deal with the link, the connection between the visible and the invisible, rupa and arupa, form and formless. It is Pythagoras who said to be the first philosopher, no, really is not the first philosopher, but the first one maybe to introduce the term philosophy. Because it is said that Pythagoras, that when the people referred to him as Sophos, he said, no, please don't call me Sophos. I'm a philosopher. Philosophos, meaning a lover of wisdom. And that's how he introduced himself. And it is Pythagoras, when he spoke about wisdom, the ideal of wisdom, he spoke about it as an, as an ideal wisdom that has uh, four archetypes, or four different expressions. Archetype as models, which are the truth, the just, the beauty, the beautiful, and the good as different expression of the same thing, as the same source. It's interesting because he called his school, it is said, the museum. But what does museum really mean? Why is the school named museum? He said, museum is the house of the muses. So the house of inspiration. And so we also, when we thought about Neopropolis, the name Neopropolis, the higher city, we thought about this concept, this universal concept, the higher city, the Astinapura, the peak of the mountain, the eternal center from where the wind of inspiration of beauty and truth blow. Can philosophy and art really transform our life and through us transform others, transform the environment? Can philosophy really change us? I would say definitely. Avashia. Surely, of course it is able to change, because it's all about change. Can there be philosophy? Can we really call philosophy as a path following wisdom that does not indicate change? Philosophy is a way of life. And we're going to connect it also to art in this way. It is an art of life. I would say art of living. It search wisdom in a way it is a search for simplicity, for more depth, for unity. And that's demand a change, or require change. Can we, through art and philosophy, find a role model, something to become, something to follow? Does philosophy or art offer us an archetype, an ideal to follow? Is there a human potential that I can find through art and through philosophy? We can hear some life experience from you. Um. I was living in the city of Ahmedabad. Uh, the air was rent with um, a lot of uh, visible and public hatred against Muslims uh, in the aftermath of the Godra event. I realized that change happens not through facts and statistics and well-researched that plays a part, but if we are relying entirely on intellectual discourse to, to shift people's ways of being uh, and ways of acting and ways of thinking, then we are, we are on a failed project. And I think for me it was a very important discovery because that was very clearly my paradigm before that. Uh, I came from a very materialist, very Punjabi, very uh, uh, non-religious, very forward-looking, uh, rationalist uh, paradigm. And in that moment of speaking to my neighbor where she said, I, I don't believe this, uh, there's other research. And I think that shifted me in the direction of wanting to a, understand the domains of faith, understand the domain of music, of art, of philosophy, of the grander 
cultural, um, spiritual symbolisms and archetypes that move human societies and move from a, a paradigm of rational knowledge and certitude to a paradigm of wonder. And uh, I think Kabir led me there and music led me there and art led me there. And, um, and I think these shifts that happen in people's ways of thinking, perceiving themselves and others, are often inexplicable. And I think this is the domain of art and poetry and music, is, is that we, as artists, we, we, we knock at the door of that. That's as most as what you can do. Because as Kabir says, it's an akat katha. It's a tale that cannot be told. But he seeks to tell it. After all, he's a poet. So he uses words to try and tell that akat katha. But this is the area of, of where things dissolve, boundaries dissolve, something melts, something shifts. And if we want to categorize it, verbalize it, language fails us because language is embedded in dualities. And what we experience as change is somewhere in that space between yes and no, between dualities. So I think uh, my journey after that moved me from a place of certitude in knowledge to a space of wonder and delight in mystery, uh, from a place of uh, anxiously seeking to define my identity in dualities, defined by pro this or anti that, to a joy of a space of not knowing, of, of collapsing those dualities in, in perceiving oneself and the world. To, to perceive the world not as us and them always, but as a play of endless reversals. You, you are here today, you are there somewhere else tomorrow, and it's a dance. Uh, it moved me from a place of rights and choices and control to a space of um, surrender, a place of faith in myself, to a faith in something that one might call maybe a higher intelligence of some kind. Um, it moved me away from looking outside for problems and trying to fix them to looking within. That's really the beginning of the journey. To see how the fissures here and the lack of peace here manifests in the world as wars. And that this inner work, the inner and the outer are connected. So it, it just transformed me and continues to uh, in many ways. First philosophy, as was said, is about love. The, the energy, the need of philosophy is love. You, you cannot be a philosopher if you don't love. It's a condition. It's not about curiosity, to know something. It's not enough, the um, intellect interest, I would say. You need to be in love. And in philosophy, it's more or less what a saying, I think it's come from, from India, from the Indian tradition. I won't say it in Hindi because I don't know your beautiful language. I only can say it in my not so beautiful English. But it is said that to follow a path, you have to become the path. I mean, to follow the wisdom, you have to become this wisdom. And the energy, the force, the ability in life to become that, allow us to become this, is love. So the, the first thing is to be in love. To be in love with what? To be in love with life. To be in love with the light. To be in love with, uh, with everything. To be in love with the universe. For me, if I come back now for my experience, what philosophy gave me, what this travel gave me, is to find the meaning of life. But it's not enough. It's not enough to approach this meaning. It's not enough to, to approach this light. It's not enough to approach this harmony. You have to offer it. You have to give it back. And here comes the art. So some of us, I choose to do it with photography. Why? Because I'm lazy. And it's a, it, I just have to, to, you know, to chick, 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 chick uh, a button. But 
it's about, I, I would like to say something. It's not just to press the button, it's when do you press the button. I'm a street photographer and I'm trying to take less pictures, but better pictures. I take very few pictures. Why? Because there is this need of if a picture does not have a meaning, a real meaning, it doesn't worth nothing. I remember one of the famous photographers, uh, one artist, which is for me the, the ideal of the way I understand photography, which is a French, it's not because I was born in Paris, nothing to, no, no. It's a French photographer from the last century, it's called uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson. He is dead now, he died, uh, in, uh, if I'm not wrong, in uh, 94, oh, for, sorry, two, 2004. And uh, he was also a street photographer, and he was using more or less the same technical. And I remember that one of his most famous photo, I don't have time now to describe the photo and anything, but a, a journalist came two years before he died and asked him what was the, the secret, how could he take this photo? It was just one moment, a decisive moment. And Cartier-Bresson said, well, you know, I didn't look. It was, uh, uh, it was a wall, the hole, a hole in the hole, a hole in the wall, yes, yeah. a hole in the wall. And they saw something, it was enough for him to take the picture. He put his camera, click. But when he made the click, he didn't look, and something occurred. One guy at this moment was jumping. So he took the pictures of this guy jumping over some pound of water. But it was not his intention. He didn't look at this. He didn't see this. He was wanted to take the pictures of the pound. He didn't see the guy. But the pictures was good because of the guy. So the journalist asked him, so you didn't see it? No. So it just, it was only luck. And Cartier-Bresson answered, yes, of course it's luck. It's always luck. It's only a matter of luck. But, but, you have to learn how to be lucky. <laughs> and what does it mean, the last thing? What does it mean? It means that you have in life a lot of opportunities. It's incredible. All, all the time, any, every second, there is something which occurs. Here, 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 a lot of opportunities. But we don't pay attention. Luck is just to learn to pay attention to all the opportunities you have in life. So we recognize the opportunity and you follow the opportunities. And luck is also to accept to be disciple, and I, I will end with this, because I know him begin to be nervous because I speak a lot. Uh, luck is also to accept to be disciple of the life, of the Dharma, of the nature, of the true, of the reality. It's about wisdom. It's about Dharma. It's about being able to discern the reality. And the art is the way to offer it to the world. Because when you produce a piece of art, which is not a piece of your personality, but you use your personality to offer something which is far more beyond your responsibility, your, your, subject, your subjectivity, sorry. Will it be a song? Will it be a dance? Will it be a picture? Will it be a text? Will it be a, anything? This is to give back this life, the true art. If you want to make the world better, you have to be a better person. Because the ultimate way to transmit is to teach through personal example. Today, we are, in my opinion, in a world where too many people are speaking very nice words, are saying very nice things, but when you see how they live, they are not always the living example of what they say. So, to gain the trust of people and to transmit, really, you must be yourself the example of what you say. And this obliges you to follow an inner path and to become a better person. This is the personal example. So it means something. It means that the important is not what you do, 
It is important what you do, but more important, it is what you are. It's not about what I have, it's about who I am, to be and not to have. So the sun, for example, uh, yesterday in another place I gave this example, the sun, by nature, is offering to all of us light, heat, and life. But he does not do nothing to do this. This is nature. He is. He is what it is, and he's giving this. So we have to be better. We have to be more wise, and we shall make the world around us better. As we are talking about uh, philosophy, art, philosopher, artist, and one's own journey, I very deeply feel that I don't know if I'm any philosopher, I don't know if I'm any artist, but I do feel that I'm a seeker. And my journey really began once I graduated from my design college. And once you graduate, I immediately got a job in a very good design studio in Mumbai. And my first day of my first job, I reached there and they briefed me about what they, the values of the company, etc., etc., and they gave me some work to do. And as I sat to do it, in about half an hour, I had just an intense discomfort churning within me. And it just got me thinking that I have been... I'm working for this company and I'm getting a salary. So they are paying me money to create. What I create or whatever I will contribute will be offered or will be shared with the client and the client is paying money to the company for what has to be created. Finally, the client takes what is created and takes it out in the market, in the public domain and it is for them to grow financially or, or to sell more or to whatever. And I just felt that, and they're going to make more money out of it in the end. And I just felt that this whole transaction is financial. And I can't be doing this for the rest of my life. And it was such a deep feeling that I went back home and I was weeping. And I was extremely clueless of what I would do or what it is that I was really seeking. But there was something that I was seeking more than what was immediately offered to me as the most uh, obvious option in life. And I just felt that everything that I'm creating here is all outside me. I'm designing, but I'm going to design, and it's an, all an external expression. And I want an internal experience. I feel very deeply about the concept of design, and I want to experience design holistically. And how do I do it? I want to design with my body. I want to design with my soul. I want to design with every being that I am. I want to understand my design. And that's how my journey into dance came. But the seeking doesn't stop there because it led me to dance, and it was more not only the form of the dance, but the approach through which that form was revealed to me opened a whole worldview of a design of being. And that was something that I was really yearning. And it comes from the Indian, uh, classical Indian art forms are deeply rooted in a worldview, a worldview which lends itself to transcendence. A worldview which at every point reveals in multiple messages and facets that the, this, the purpose of this life is to grow, to transcend, to dive into a higher dimension, or I would say an inner dimension. And here was an art form which I was engaging with my body, but somewhere it gave me that facility and the approach of my teacher, which was very deep rooted in inner work, completely facilitated that. In the Indian text, there is a very beautiful verse that says that from the formless comes the form and the form takes you back to the formless. 
And this is the essence of all Indian arts, that there is a formless conception that the purpose of this life is to transcend, to grow. It's a very audacious vision or even a conception because we all know it's, transcendence is not linear. It is not something that I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to transcend and I'm going to... It doesn't work that way. And in that light, the culture has created many ladders which facilitate this transcendence. The classical Indian dance is one such ladder that if you climb on it systematically, somewhere it will give you a glimpse and an experience of that. All the forms, so in the Indian, most of you all, if you all have seen classical Indian dance, you sing and praise it, the gods and goddesses. The gods and goddesses are symbols. But to me they are not even symbols, they are actually principles. And you pierce from the formless, from the form of say a Shiva or a Krishna or a Rama, that's a form, there's a physical form who you'll dance and sing and you'll describe. But the Shiva and Krishna are actually symbols. And you go into the symbolism, but from the symbolism there is another layer. That they are actually principles, they are all ways of being, or ways of experiencing that you need to pierce into your life. And that has been my journey of seeking that somewhere through this whole expanse of art, what I was seeking, what I am still seeking, it gives me the facility to travel inward. After the fall, history continues. The purpose of this book is to talk about, to explain, let's say, what you are on, uh, begin to uh, explain at the beginning as the Middle Age. I'm talking about a new Middle Age. Middle Age is not only a historic moment. Middle Age is more a mentality. The mentality of Middle Ages is a mentality of separation, a mentality of uh, chaos, a mentality of uh, fighting, of uh, lack of union, and it is more or less what we are seeing today. There are some clouds between us and the sun, between us and the, this light of consciousness, of wisdom. But after every Middle Age comes a renaissance. There is an opportunity to be reborn. What I try to explain in this book is that we are into a Middle Age, but it is a very special Middle Age. Because it's like if we are in a cave, in a, um, maybe I will say prison, prison, but we build our own prison. There is no really um, a dictator, there are some in the world, but there is not really somebody who will uh, enforce us to be prisoners. We are the prisoners of ourselves because we build our own prison. We build on our, our own ignorance, let's say. If it is with the nonsense that uh, exists in, in the world, in the media, in the TV, in the newspaper, in the fake news, in the post-truth, what Yaron told before, and we are uh, TV reality and all these sort of things. We are happy with this because we have lost the need to fight, to search for a meaning. So we have built our own prison. We are the owner or the builder, let's say, of our own ignorance. And the question is, how can we become aware of this and begin a path a return, a path of return toward the light, or toward the Renaissance. And I explain in the book that uh, the tools to do this are more or less what we spoke now, philosophy, art, 
and it's a regain of the humanity. We have forget what this what this means to be human being. We have fallen into that uh, the meaning of life is to be comfortable. The meaning of life is to not to be disturbed. And uh, I'm explaining in the book that uh, we need to regain the spirit of the fighter, the spirit of the warrior inside ourselves. The spirit, you will say in India, of the Kshatriya, maybe. And this spirit of the Kshatriya lie, I believe this, lie inside every one of us. It just sleeps. So we have to awake this in ourselves because if we don't do it, we are not really alive. We are just surviving. We are born to being alive. We are not born to be comfortable. It's nice to be comfortable, but it's a tramp. Trap, trap. Tramp is something else. It's a trap. We have already fallen in these traps. But to get out of the trap, we have to recognize the trap because we cannot get out of the prison if we don't know that we are in the prison. This is the first ignorance. So first we have to understand that we are in the prison. This is the Maya. This is the trap of the Maya. We are inside the Maya. So we have to, to understand it and to get out of it. And it's easy. It's easier than we think because we are the our builders of this. So what we have built, we can destroy. I believe that everyone can regain his own freedom. It's only a matter of will, of need, and maybe like I said at the beginning, of love. If we love enough life, we shall be alive. Thank you. And this song comes with a story. Some of you may have heard this. But I think it speaks to everything we have been talking about here. About who am I? Asking that question. Somebody asked Kabir this question. And he said, Jat Hamari Atma or Prana Hamara Nam Alak Hamara Ishta Hai or Kagan Hamara Gam. So, uh, especially if you travel in rural areas in India, the first question you will be asked is, Aapki Jat Kya Hai? So Kabir says, Jat Hamari Atma, my soul is my caste. Pran Hamara Naam, my name is my life force itself. Alak Hamara Ishta Hai, my beloved deity is the invisible one, Alak, that cannot be seen. And the other question that comes up, native ka hai, native place ka hai. So Kabir says, Gagan Hamara Gaon. My native village is the sky itself. To jat hamari atma Prana hamara na Alak hamara ishd hai Aur gagan hamara gaon Another image Kabir uses to give us an intuition of our vaster cosmic self is to bund padi samund me jane hai sab koi samund samana bund me jane birla ko that the drop is in the ocean, yeah, that's common knowledge. Everybody knows. But that the ocean is in the drop, that the rare one comes to know. A Sufi says the same thing. Agar katra 
कतरा इस बूंद ड्रॉप अगर कतरा न दरिया से अगर कतरा न दरिया से जुदा होता तो क्या होता वही होता जो है इसके सिवा होता तो क्या होता न होने पर तो दुनिया की निगाहें खा गई धोखा जो तेरे माँ सिवा कोई खुदा होता तो क्या होता जो यूं होता तो क्या होता जो यूं होता तो क्या होता See the difference between saying you are a cosmic self and listening to this poem and something shifts some some intimation comes from somewhere to you that yes you are something else So this song is from Rajasthan Sorry did that need translation Yes agar katra na darya se juda hota to kya hota if the drop was not separate from the ocean what would it be wahi hota jo hai iske siwa hota to kya hota it would be what it is how could it be anything else so kabir often speaks of darya ki lehar daryao hai ji uthe to pani baithe to pani dooja kaho kis tarah ho hum the wave is the ocean would you say the wave is separate from the ocean when it rises its water when it sets its water how can you say it's different na hone par to duniya ki nigahein kha gayi dhoka so the the gaze of the world was fooled in the not being fooled into feeling the separation jo tere ma siwa koi khuda hota to kya hota you are god himself you have that vastness in you so this story also uh, speaks of water and love in a sense uh it's based on a kabi it's a kabir song that i'm singing to you from rajasthan it's in marwadi but it's also a very famous buddhist parable because all good ideas and songs have no borders and no ipr like pier said so uh there was once a vast jungle and in it lived many birds and animals there was a sandalwood tree there was a bamboo forest in it and there was a brave little parrot whom i like to think of as a she she lived on this sandalwood tree and loved this forest dearly and she had a a sense of herself that we are speaking of one day a fire blazed into the forest and started rapidly covering ground and grew into a huge furnace all the animals and birds began to flee and run for cover flee the forest to save their lives but this little parrot she didn't go she came and sat on the sandalwood tree and the tree said to her i have roots you have wings fly away while you can and she turned to her and said phal khada pan birodia ramya dalo dal i ate your fruit i soiled your leaves i played from branch to branch tam jalo main ubru jivdon kitre ek bar you burn and i fly away how many times do you get this opportunity to live she asks live and love So what does this parrot do? 
she finds a lake close by and she goes and plunges into the lake comes back over this blazing forest fire and flaps her two little wings and two drops of water fall then she goes back to the lake plunges in comes back flaps her two little wings and another two three drops of water fall and then she goes back to the lake plunges in and she comes back and she again flaps her wings and again two three drops of water fall and the other birds and animals look at her and, and are aghast they are angry they are scoffing they laugh at her they think she's foolish she's mad they tell her run away while you still have time they they just look at her and shout what do you think you're doing and she turns to them and she says i'm doing what i can uh and the clouds are rolling by and this bird is doing what she's doing and on it the buddhas or the devas depending on which version of the story you hear are passing by and one of them happens to look down and see this bird and her dedication and he converts himself into an eagle and comes and swoops around the bird and circles her to observe what is this what is this and when he sees this bird's action he is so moved that tears come to his eyes and when the gods begin to weep what happens it rains so we have to go out there to stop that tree from being cut uh where does that action spring from uh that's i think the whole debate this evening has been uh when love and fearless action arises in the moment with no thought of future or past just in the moment it comes from a place of uh deep connection with everything of non separation so this is the marwadi song and it says kin sankaras ne whom should i love sangat ki jo dharmi sadhri keep the company of pure hearted ones of good seekers baasu go ina bag mein tharak rahi ban rahe uh, the bamboo grew and the forest trembled in fear uh, agni ghani ang mai it's got a lot of fire in its belly and then dav lagyo panchi baitho aaye and it ends with the dav bujho dav is fire was extinguished jhada metia doodhe bootha me the clouds poured milk kahe kabir dharmdas se nit nit navlo ne says kabir to dharmdas his disciple every day my love is new is fresh it's in the moment <laughs> and it's addressed to the heli saheli my dear girlfriend e mari heli e kirna sam karo me sne i think i need this up here
Do 